Peaceful greetings from the Shemite Heritage Conservatory. In our last video, we presented the backbone genealogy of the peoples of the world. That framework is critical in understanding the plan of salvation for both Israelites and non-Israelites according to the covenant given through Moses and the earlier patriarchs. This video is a continuation of the series about the world territories wherein we will present the present boundaries of each territory because that is critical in understanding the geopolitical events that will happen as prophesied in the book of Revelation. The information in this video is according to how Noah divided and allocated the world for the nations and descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth after the flood. No one could understand the present geopolitical events and its direction into the future unless they go back to the table of nations stated in the Bible as a history book. It is on that book where the destiny of humanity has been charted. Now, listen very carefully. The territories of each nation has been the major source of conflict among the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth since time immemorial. That conflict will eventually culminate in the very near future as written in the book of Revelation. Just think about this. Why do nations scramble to build up their armory, artillery, and missile capability? Why are they stockpiling such weapons? What for? Think about those questions to feel the reality of what we are talking about. Right now, the nations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth are behaving according to the words of the prophets and sages foretold thousands and thousands of years ago. We are almost at the end of the timeline. What can we do? Can we stop it? No. The truth is, no level of diplomacy will ever be effective to control the ticking of the clock. Let it be, for whatever has been written, it is what will pass. All we can do is prepare and brace for the impact. If you are prepared, then you need not worry. So how do we prepare? The first step would be to understand the trajectory of the geopolitical events starting from the world territories. But in order to understand the territories, we need to first identify the landmarks. After the flood, Noah divided the world into his three sons for their future generations and nations. How did Noah divide the whole earth? Did Noah use satellites and GPS? Did Noah use geodetical principles like the longitude and the latitude used in aeronautics and navigation? No. Such technologies do not exist in the time of Noah. Instead, Noah used landmarks including, but not limited to the following. Number one, rivers. Number two, mountains. Number three, major directions, that is, north, south, east, and west. Number four, land shapes, such as the tongue of the Egyptian sea. Number five, minerals, such as salt, gold, delium, and onyx stone, and the list goes on and on. Pretty simple, right? No. In many parts of the Bible, there are seemingly difficult descriptions that we also need to understand. Examples are the following. Number one, ends of the earth, such as used by prophet Isaiah. Where do you find the ends of the earth? Antarctica? Nope. Also mentioned in the Bible, especially by Prophet Isaiah, are the isles. That is number two. Which isles was Prophet Isaiah talking about? Number three, abyss or abysses. Number four, great sea. 
These landmarks and descriptions must be understood based on their original ancient meanings rather than on their modern meanings. Remember, we would be interpreting books that has been written thousands of years ago when the idea about cars is not even in the wildest imagination of the people. A clear understanding of the words and terminologies is a must because they are critical in deducing and interpreting what the Bible is really talking about. Along the way, we will correct misconceptions as we encounter them. Talking about territories as defined by Noah, let us begin with the landmarks. As mentioned earlier, we have rivers. Yes, the rivers of Genesis. So, what is a river? The question may sound simple. Many people imagine a river as a flowing body of water where boats are sailing and where people go out for fishing. But that is not the way how you should understand and imagine the rivers of Genesis, namely, number one, Pison or Pishon, number two, Gihon, and number three, Hidikel, and number four, Parat or Ferat. Collectively, we can also call them as rivers of Eden, for their origin is from Eden. Interestingly, there are videos and blogs that say these rivers are in the bottom of the ocean. We strongly say no to such claims. Here are the points of argument. Number one, how can a river be on the deepest geographical location lower than the land for which they are designed to deliver water? Number two, in the case of Hidikel, how could it be in the bottom of the ocean when in fact the prophet Daniel had a vision while standing on the river banks of Hidikel. Another thing is that it is written in Revelation that the waters of Hidikel will dry up in the last days. And here is the next point of argument against the bottom of the ocean theory. In the case of Gihon, it must be recalled that King Solomon was anointed in Gihon. Therefore, it is not in the bottom of the ocean. We will clarify things about Gihon because it is also described to be in the land of Cush. It only takes common sense and of course logical thinking. So, what is the truth? Where could these rivers be? The rivers of Genesis are not in the bottom of the ocean, though part of them may have probably formed part of a sea considering climate changes and geological events with the passage of time. We could not give up looking up for them because they are part of the significant landmarks that determine the world territories which eventually became a major source of conflict among the nations today. Interestingly, Prophet Isaiah pointed us to the right direction. He gave us the idea where to start looking for these rivers. He wrote, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 18, I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. It says, Rivers can be found in the high places or shall we say high altitude mountains that is further clarified by prophet Isaiah himself in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 25 and there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall clear enough in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 18, Prophet Isaiah gave the most probable location of the rivers of Genesis. He was saying that the rivers are on top of the mountains or high places. You will soon discover that the term river actually describes a natural network of water delivery system composed of the source and the storage of water on top of the mountains. Here is another thing to consider. Pools or lakes and delivery systems on the surface of the ground and even subterranean tunnels are part 
of the river system network. That is the right context of the word river as used in Genesis. It is referring to a vast interconnected network of natural water delivery system. This system maintains the balance of distribution and storage of water for the worldwide ecosystem. Let us review the natural water system as used in geography and geology. One will realize that the water system is a continuous cycle and recycling process. Water is collected from the atmosphere by the high mountains. It is either frozen and stored as water reserves or it may be outrightly delivered to the lower lands and forests where it is consumed and some evaporates to the atmosphere. The excess goes to the sea from where a significant portion evaporates back to the atmosphere collected again by the high mountains and the cycle is repeated. A network of these cycling and recycling water systems work together to maintain balance and distribution of water for the entire planet. In Genesis, they were named as Pison, Gihon, Hidikel, and Parat. As it turns out, their function is not only to maintain the water and ecological balance, but they also act as important landmarks of the world territories. The latter is our focus. So, let us start with Gihon. According to the Strong's Hebrew and Chaldi Dictionary, the word Gihon is from Giyak and Gikon, which means to gush forth, break forth a fountain, a valley, or pool near Jerusalem. Reference. Gihon 1518 to 1521, Strong's Hebrew and Chaldee Dictionary, James Strong, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, Complete and Unabridged, Waco, Texas, Workbooks 1977 edition. In effect, the definition gives the description or characteristic of the Gihon River system. The system is composed of streams, gushing and sparting fountains pools, and valleys. Do not forget those characteristics because we will use them to locate the entire length of the Gihon River system. There are a number of instances where the Gihon water system is mentioned in the Bible. The first instance is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10 to 14. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it that compasses the whole land of Cush. To understand what this verse is telling us about the location of Gihon, we need to answer first the following questions. Number one, who is Cush? And number two, where is the land of Cush? In the preceding video prior to this one, we have already presented the world family tree or genealogy. We have shown that Cush is the son of Ham and Cush is a grandson of Noah. Please read Genesis chapter 10 verse 6. Cush is a Hamite. During the time of classical antiquity, that is 8th BC to 6th AD, the Cushite imperial capital was in Menro until the 4th century AD. The ancient kingdom of Cush collapsed due to an internal rebellion. The kingdom of Cush was replaced by the kingdom of Aksum or the so-called Aksumite Empire that was built by an alleged son of Cush in 180 to 940 AD. The land occupied by the kingdom of Cush was Ethiopia while the Aksumite kingdom included Eritrea and the Tigray region of the northern Ethiopia. Reference the Wealth of Africa, the Kingdom of Aksum, Teacher's Notes, British Museum.org. Also Wikipedia. Read Kingdom of Kush and Kingdom of Aksum. So let's continue. The Kingdom of Aksum has its own currency that uses gold coins for trading and commerce. It is important to note that according to the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, 
The Kingdom of Aksum was an active participant in the ancient Silk Road of China. Eritrea was one of the centers of commerce connecting Africa to the ancient maritime Silk Road. At present, the ancient Silk Road of China is being revived through the Belt and Road Initiative with Eritrea and Ethiopia being once again the biggest trading hub in Africa. Very few realize that this event is fulfilling a biblical prophecy, but we will talk about that separately in one of our future videos. So let's continue. That a large swath of Africa was then called Ethiopia. That is why the sea down below Africa was then called Ethiopian Sea. The Ethiopian Sea was later renamed into South Atlantic Ocean in modern maps. Seemingly, the change of the name from Ethiopian Sea to South Atlantic Ocean had a negative impact on the historical significance of Ethiopia. So, why are we going into these details? Because we need to answer the question, where is the land of Cush? Remember, the Gihon River mentioned in Genesis is said to be found in the land of Cush. Finding Gihon is the turnkey that will lead us to discover the remaining rivers of Eden and ultimately reveal the world territories set by Noah after the flood. Let me read again Genesis chapter 2 verse 10 to 14. Emphasis on verse 13. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasses the whole land of Cush. You hear that? The land of Cush is where we can find the Gihon River. Collectively, the lands occupied by the ancient kingdom of Cush, kingdom of Aksum, and the Ethiopian Empire is the land of Cush referred to in Genesis where we could find the Gihon River. Genesis is referring to the entire southern half of the African continent from the Horn of Africa in the east, traversing to the west. Looking for Gihon, let us recall the characteristic or description of this water system. The word Gihon is from Giyak and Gikon, which means to gush forth, break forth, a fountain or valley or pool near Jerusalem. It means the Gihon River system is composed of streams, gushing and sparting fountains or pool or valley. Notice that Gihon is not only a water body but may also include a valley. Now, here is the question. Are there water bodies and geological forms in the southern half of Africa that matches the description of Gihon? Yes. There are sporting fountains, gushing holes, pools, and valleys in Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Ethiopian Empire of Africa that match the characteristic of Gihon. You barely notice them because these geological forms are now called by different terminologies in modern geology and geography. On screen, is a table showing the biblical terms on the left column and the opposite to the right is the equivalent term used in modern geology. As you can see, the biblical term Gihon means fountain. In modern geology, we call it geysers. Gihon means a pool. In geology, it is lake. Gihon could also refer to a valley. In modern geology, it is now called a reef or depression. Can you find them in the southern half of African region? Yes, absolutely. Take for example, the Nakil Depression which is part of the Afar Depression or Afar Triangle in the Ethiopian Reef Valley. This valley is one of the lowest or deepest depression in the world and one of the hottest valleys. Many geysers, active or extinct, are also found along the reef valleys in the southern half of the African continent. 
Reference Vivian Cumming, Ethiopia's Danakal Depression, BBC Earth, 15th June 2016. To wrap up, the Gihon River mentioned in Genesis is found in Africa. But what about the other Gihon where King Solomon was anointed King of Israel to succeed his father David? Many Bible scholars are confused about Gihon because the Bible mentions them to be in two separate locations. The first Gihon is found in the land of Cush according to Genesis and the other one found in Jerusalem. Are there two Gihon rivers? If yes, how are they related to each other? To shed light into these perplexing issues, let us dig as much information we can dig about the Gihon in Jerusalem. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 38 So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Baniah the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. This event was also mentioned by Josephus Flavius in his book Antiquities of the Jews. He described Gihon as a fountain outside of Jerusalem. Note again, Gihon was described by Josephus as a fountain in Jerusalem. He was referring to Gihon Spring or fountain where Solomon was anointed. He also stated that this Gihon fountain or spring was the major source of water for the old city of Jerusalem in the ancient past. Three tunnels were constructed from Gihon Spring, including the Hezekiah Tunnel. Reference, Antiquities of the Jews by William Winston, M.A. Professor of the Mathematics in the University of Cambridge, London, 1737. The information written by Josephus corroborated with what is written in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 30. It was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the spring of Gihon and channeled it down to the west side of the city of David, and Hezekiah prospered in all that he did. According to the book entitled Jerusalem, History, Archaeology, and Apologetic by Galen Weimers, Gihon Spring is found outside the walled old city on the eastern part of the Kidron Valley. It has a length of 20 miles and falls 4,000 feet down to the Dead Sea. The book confirmed what is written in 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 38 that says, King Solomon riding on a mule went down to Gihon. So Gihon is in a lower ground level. According to an entry in Wikipedia, the Gihon Spring in Israel known today as Fountain of the Virgin has intermittent gushing and sparting pattern. The water comes out three to five times a day during winter, two times a day during summer, and once a day during autumn. Once again, this confirms the characteristic of Gihon being a sparting and gushing water system. So, here are the more important and relevant information about the Gihon's spring in Israel. Number one, location. It is found in a valley downwards into the Dead Sea. Number two, water has intermittent gushing and sparting characteristic similar to the Gihon in Africa. It now appears that both the Gihon in Africa and the Gihon in Israel have gushing and sparting characteristic. Have you noticed? Now, here is a big question. Could there be a possible biblical and geological connection between the two Gihon? If you are a fast thinker, you might reach a tentative conclusion that Gihon in Israel and Gihon in Africa is one and the same or might be connected to each other. Hold on till the end of this series. You will be surprised with what you will discover.
looking forward to the continuation of the World Territory Series. On our next video, we will show a layman's plotting of the Gihon River through the guidance of three prophets who knows the mystery. Yes, three prophets who are guided by the words and direction of Prophet Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Sephaniah on this journey. So, here is our message to Bible scholars, preachers, ministers, and enthusiasts all over the world. Do you have any idea where this discussion is leading? This will take you all the way to the book of Revelation. To our beloved audience, wherever you are in the world, you know who you are. Just look at yourself in front of a mirror. You are men of colors. If you are in Africa right now, or if you can trace your roots in Africa, Prophet Zephaniah had written about you. Listen very carefully. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. Rivers of Cush is part of Gihon River. If this video is resonating with your heart and soul, then you must be one of us, remnants of Jacob's Israel. The rivers, mountains, and valleys will reveal the truth. You need to wake up from your slumber, reclaim the biblical identity, and get out from the Babylonian religions and systems. Only then, your suffering will end. You need to rediscover your ancestral past to learn who you are and claim what is due to you according to the covenant given to our great ancestors, the sages and prophets. The Helper has come. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 11. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. The helper from the east has come. The heavenly kingdom is dawning. The gospel about the kingdom is now being preached all over the world. Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Make sure no one deceives you. The true helper for the remnants of Jacob comes from the east, bringing the message about the kingdom the covenant, and the true name of our Creator. The true messenger has only one purpose, that is, to guide you back to the covenant which had been forgotten. The messages will be plain and pure from the Torah that was given to us through Moses. Do not be deceived by anyone who preaches doctrines that lead you away from the laws and covenant. We will continue the message of this series on the next video. Make sure you are subscribed into our legitimate channel, Shemite Heritage Conservatory. Help us spread the message by spreading our videos to your family, relatives, and friends. Be blessed. Shalom.